Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we are going to explore the Skoll Experiment. My guest is Robin Foy, the founder of the Skoll Experimental Group. He is the author of In Pursuit of Physical Mediumship and Witnessing the Impossible. I think for many viewers, what you're about to hear on this video and what you would have heard on the previous video with Robin Foy may sound completely unacceptable and unbelievable. I can only assure you that uh, the work he is doing has been taken very seriously by the members of the Society for Psychical Research in England, who issued this extensive report on their two-year investigation, during which they found numerous astounding physical phenomena that occurred, uh, no hint whatsoever of uh, fraud or cheating of any kind. Alan Gauld, uh, one of the uh, presidents of former presidents of the Society for Psychical Research and a noted historian in the field, added in his critical comments on the report that uh, he had known Robin Foy for 30 years at that time, back in the late 1990s, and had never any reason to suspect him of anything but the highest integrity. So, unbelievable, as bizarre as it is, it's worth being treated very seriously. Robin is currently in Spain, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Robin. It's great to be with you once again. Thanks very much. Good to see you again. We had a fascinating conversation last time, pretty much covering all of your explorations uh, leading up to the uh, beginning of the very significant work you did with the Skoll Group. And as I reflect back on the many years you spent sitting in seances and meeting with different mediums and witnessing a wide range of physical mediumship phenomena, I have the sense that it was a sort of uh, start and stop, start and stop, start and stop, that groups would come together and you would get phenomena going, and then for one reason or another, things would sort of drift away or fall apart. Yeah, that's exactly it. And that's how it is with uh, many people that get involved in this uh, psychic research involving physical mediumship. Uh, physical mediumship itself is a pretty rare thing. Um, there are very, very few uh, genuine, good physical mediums around the world today. Um, few here, few there. Um, but certainly back in 1990, um, when we started to sort of think about uh, a serious group, and we'd moved to Skoll by that time, uh, it was at that point that we considered, um, you know, really sort of getting into it in a proper way. Um, but you're right, we'd been starting and stopping, starting and stopping. And a lot of that is down to the personalities that you meet along the way, personalities that think they're going to enjoy sitting in a, in a group to develop psychic phenomena. Uh, if the psychic phenomena doesn't come along in two days time, sometimes they'll drop out. Uh, and that's an awful shame because you really have to keep your nose to the grindstone to get these things developed. Uh, and that's what, what we've done all these years. Uh, and uh, we didn't really expect Skull when it happened to happen as it did or as, as well or as fast as it did. Um, but it was quite amazing. And uh, it took us all by surprise. But we went along with it and we loved every minute of it. Uh, it involved 5000 hours. Uh, sorry, a, a thousand hours of phenomena. Uh, and uh, that was over over a period of, of five years. So about a thousand hours a year uh, of actually sitting there and getting fantastic phenomena. But we, we built a wonderful relationship with our spirit team. Uh, and it was absolutely um, just as though they were our partners, um, you know, sort of on this side. 
and we got to know them so well and they made a point of, of getting our confidence um, by giving us information that none of us could possibly have known but which turned out to be totally accurate uh, once we checked it out afterwards uh, and of course it got to the stage that we trusted them totally. Well, let's talk about the members of the spirit team. You you refer to one spirit, for example, uh, who seems to appear at every session uh, called Manu. Uh, yes, indeed. Um, Manu was the uh, was the main guide, I think, actually, of, of one of the, the two mediums. We had two mediums in the group. One of them um, was Diana and the other one was Alan um, Bennett. They were both, uh, they were a married couple. Uh, and we met them basically because at the time that we moved to Skull, I was running an organization called the Noah's Ark Society, which I had started in 1990 to actually save physical mediumship, which at that point um, was could easily have become totally extinct because there were no new mediums developing that we were aware of at that time. Uh, the subject wasn't um, as popular as it is today. And I I hope we've actually had a little hand in helping that. Uh, and all over the world now, people are talking physical mediumship, are developing physical mediumship, are demonstrating physical mediumship. And it's quite wonderful. There is a, a, a definite difference now uh, and to the days when we were actually running these things at Skull, um, because now technology has moved on so rapidly uh, that people are able to do all sorts of different experiments um, which at the time that we, we, we actually had the skull circle were imp impossible because the technology wasn't available at that time. Now they're able to get much more ITC contact with the spirit world through instruments, uh, in instrumental transcommunication, and it can take the form of all sorts of devices. Spirit can, can actually communicate with us through, uh, commu uh, through computers, um, through telephones, uh, through various other different types of, of machine that uh, they weren't able to use way back in 1990. Although we did have a couple of instances ourselves of telephone calls um, from the dead, if you like. Uh, and uh, one of those involved um, my father dying um, in the 1980s. Uh, and we had driven all the way from Norfolk up to his home which then was in Grimsby on, on Humberside in, in the UK. Uh, and uh, we'd visited him in the hospital and been told that he hadn't got long to go. Uh, we came home and, and sort of phoned Sandra's daughter. And right in the middle of that call, um, we got a, a spirit personality came and spoke to us and said, we're just waiting for his death. It'll be just an hour. Uh, and uh, lo and behold, an hour later, he passed a spirit. That's a roundabout story. Uh, you've covered a lot of ground, but uh, two things. Going back to uh, the personality of Manu, was Manu a, a deceased person? And, and also, I think what was unique about your group, uh, to my understanding, is that you had two mediums going into trance simultaneously. We did indeed, yes. As I said, a married couple, and yeah, I'd sort of gone off the uh, off off the boil there, um, talking about different things. But certainly, Manu was was the main main guide of Diana, uh, and uh, he was heavily involved uh, in his lifetime in all sorts of different um, uh, energies uh, and crystals, uh, and and that was one of the things he was working with 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 us. And setting it all up at the beginning, if you like. But he was always the first guide to speak through Diana. Um, and Diana was the first of the two mediums uh, in trance to speak at that time. So I, I'm under the impression that you really developed a close relationship with Manu, as close as you might have with any of your best friends. We did indeed. And uh, all of our um, spirit friends in, in, in the group that we were working with um, actually came to be just like family. Uh, and as you can imagine, when it did finish five years after we'd started, uh, and that was in November in uh, 1998, um, we were totally devastated because it was like losing a family of 10 or so friends uh, all at the same time. Um, but yes, we we got very, very close indeed to him. Manu was um, uh, was the one guide that spoke at every single session. 
Um, very few of them spoke at every session, um, but we did have another another lady that came along, uh, and she was quite amazing. Uh, we knew that it wasn't her correct name because we'd been told that, that most of these guides uh, were giving us um, sort of, um, well, well, not false names, but pseudonyms. Um, and they told us the reason that they were giving us pseudonyms was because they were well known in life uh, and they didn't want anybody to start saying um, if, if they were either present with us or if, if, if they were examining some of the work we'd done. They didn't want anyone to start talking about who they were and were they the real people, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and consequently, you know, sort of they gave, they gave us sort of pseudonyms. Uh, and one of the ladies, well, the lady who we spent a lot of time with and she spent a lot of time with us, we came to know as um, uh, Emily and she called herself Emily Bradshaw. Uh, and uh, I don't think any of the others ever actually worked out who she was, but I think I know who she was. Uh, and uh, the point was that she didn't want her living relatives um to be aware of the fact that she was acting as a guide uh and so consequently you know it was all kept very very quiet uh and uh with our work today we have quite a lot of these this spirit team that we had at skull are going to be working with us when we start the new talk alex ex, um, experimental group uh in july when we move to the new center uh, and this lady we feel will be one of the the main communicators in the future uh, and Emily was was probably the best communicator from the point of view of evidence that we had during the sittings at Skull uh, and there were one or two very very evidential cases uh, that she spoke to us about that proved to be very very evidential indeed. But by and large, you were getting physical phenomena rather than uh, evidence in the, in the form of mental mediumship. Yeah, but the two were combined, basically, because um, all the time that the phenomena was going on, um, we were also still having um, vo uh, trans communications through the two mediums. So it's quite possible um, that Emily Bradshaw would say to us, are you looking to your right? There's going to be a spirit light there. And that just as we looked to the right hand side, there'd be a spirit light. So in a way, she was acting as a bit of an MC. Um, sort of saying, well, this is going to happen or that's going to happen. Uh, and just after she'd said it, it would it would happen. Um, so she almost became a surrogate mother to us. Um, we, you know, we, we came to love Emily very, very dearly. Uh, and we are delighted to be able to say that um, Emily uh, will be working with us in the future, um, but she won't be using the same name. We will probably know her as Ida in the future. Well, amongst the um, guides that you had, I, I gather there m might have been as many as a dozen. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And th these were the people that spoke to us on a fairly regular basis. Um, there were also, um, we, we had scientists. Uh, there were two very well-known scientists, William Crooks uh, and, and William Barrett. Uh, both of them had been involved in the past um, in their own sort of psychic research, uh, and they continued their interest, obviously, into the spirit world. Uh, and we believe that uh, particularly William Barrett uh, visits a number of different circles and helps uh, in the technology and the science of, of several different circles. Uh, also, William Crooks uh, is, is uh, visiting different circles we we hear of this now because we have an organization where circles are uh, passing information to us uh, and consequently we can recognize when some of the people that crop up at other circles are very much the same as ones that have cropped up as our, at ours. Well, I am under the impression that uh, when William Crooks or William Barrett uh, or other identifiable personalities come through, it was not a priority for your group to try and uh, get them to provide evidence that would prove their identity. Uh, no, we didn't feel the necessity to do that, um, mainly because um, each and every one of them really, um, apart from um, Emily, 
um, did actually prove their identity to, to us anyway. So we were very much aware that we had the genuine people there. Uh, and, uh, I mean, they gave us information about themselves, their own lives, uh, when they were on Earth that none of us knew about, um, but which, uh, when we looked it up afterwards, um, became obvious that it, it was actually a very, very evidential bit of information they'd given us. So we had a pretty good idea who most of them were. Uh, and uh, we sort of followed it up wherever we could um, by really sort of acting as, a, 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 as partners to our spirit friends. Well, you use the word partners, but as I read through uh, your book, Witnessing the Impossible, I got the impression that one of the unique features of your group is that you decided to let the spirit team really take the lead and, and for the most part, call the shots. Yeah, that's exactly how we worked it, because um, we discovered uh, through through the actual work we were doing uh, that if the spirit team said to us that they, they would like us to, to do a certain thing, um, to place a mirror in there, for instance, or to use a camera in there, um, and we did exactly what they asked, uh, then things just worked exactly as they should. Uh, and they, they were very pleased because we did that and we weren't really trying to probe any further at that point into who they were or or what have you um, but they were trying to prove um, that the the means of, of producing the phenomena was totally different from the means that had been used in the past um, the traditional way of producing physical mediumship was uh, the substance ectoplasm uh, which has, has, has long been a, a, a sought after um, recipe, if you like, to find out exactly what ectoplasm is. Um, but it's still used today by a number of, of uh, physical mediums in this world. Uh, the, probably the best known of those today is a German medium called Kai Muga. Uh, and he is he's now getting, he's developed his phenomena so far, he's now getting full form um, materializations in the light um, that are created by ectoplasm. But it is a substance that, that is actually within the bodies. Uh, it's a chemical substance within the bodies of the mediums themselves. Uh, and, and it's added to by using some of some of the um, sort of chemicals within the bodies of the sitters. Uh, and when it's all mixed together, it forms a sort of a substance which is, is sort of um, a living substance is the best way to describe it. Um, it's almost like a very thick fog in many ways. Um, but it acts it, it acts in so many different ways. It, it can be um, scattered all over the room at one time. And within half a second, it can become a, a, a solid object. Uh, and this, of course, the, all, all this ectoplasm actually comes out of any and all of the orifices of a physical medium. Uh, and for work with uh, with the um, ectoplasm, a physical medium really needs to be in deep trance. That's not always the case um, when you're working in a different way as we worked at Skull, um, because that was a, a mixture of energy which the spirit team pioneered at that time to be able to use to produce similar phenomena to the phenomena that was produced with ectoplasm, but a phenomena that could go much further and was done in a totally different way. Uh, for instance, if we had a materialized spirit person in the room at Skull, and very often we would have anything up to eight uh, materialized spirit people there in the room at any one time, uh, then they would have been teleported into the room through a portal which had been built by the spirit team. Um, so <clears throat> it's very much like Star Trek. Uh, the, the, you remember the old series Star Trek where they all stood on a plinth uh, and they were beamed up or beamed down. Uh, and the whole process um, is very much like that. But when uh, a, a personality from the spirit world is teleported into a solid form in, as they were with us, um, they don't wear um, spirit drapes, which is, is one of the things that you get when you're using ectoplasm. And usually it's a white, uh, like a white gown spirit drape around the, the materialized person. But they sort of come purely and simply in the way that they would if they were alive, so that they come with normal clothes on. Uh, and I well remember a, a, a sitting uh, in we had a, a demonstration, and that was in Los Angeles, 
Uh, and uh, there was one lady there that spoke to us afterwards. We were They were told by the spirit team, anybody that was at a seminar, that if they were touched, they could touch back. Uh, and this lady actually was touched on the arm or the hand and touched back. Uh, and she moved she moved her hand sort of from the spirit's hand up the arm and immediately felt a shirt and then a, a, a jacket sleeve uh, and continued to move her arm uh, sort of up this this arm of the spirit person till she came to the shoulder. But then she got a, a, a heck of a shock because they'd only partly materialized this spirit person. Uh, and after the shoulder, there was nothing there, although the arm was totally animated. So she was very, very surprised by that. But that simply demonstrated that they would come with normal everyday clothes on just as they had worn when they were on this earth. Well, it seems to me from your description that the the chemistry of the individuals involved and their willingness to trust the phenomenon is, is very important. Anytime you had a visitor who was full of skepticism and distrust, sometimes even hostility, that would suppress the phenomena. It most certainly did. And, and we had a few instances um, because uh, we did actually introduce uh, members of the SPR, um, the, the Society, Society for Psychical Research, and you've got an ASPR in America, of course. Uh, and uh, both these societies tend to be sort of um, peopled by chaps and, and ladies who were uh, are well known in their own field. Very often scientists, very often lawyers, very often um, you know people that are, that are well known for something or other, uh, and. The scientific side tends to sort of run the SPR today so that um, they're a very, very skeptical organization. Uh, and we had um, three um, sort of very, very senior SPR guys that came and sat with us on a regular basis uh, at Skull. Uh, and, and these chaps were absolutely quite amazed um, by they came for 25 sittings or more over a period of two years. Uh, and, and they were just absolutely amazed by what they were experiencing and convinced beyond all doubt, all three of them, uh, that everything they witnessed was 100 percent genuine. And that was very, very important to us because they actually put out a report, the SPR, um, on, on the, the, the Skull Report, it was called. Uh, and it was very, very much in favor of everything they'd seen and everything they'd been involved in actually being uh, genuine. Um, but you're right, because they did ask on occasions and they asked the spirit team, given their due, um, they didn't just try and force other people to come in from the SPR. They asked, asked, asked if so-and-so or so-and-so could come in and sit. Uh, and uh, uh, they, they were, yes, they, they were told, yes, they could or no, they, no, they couldn't. Um, but there were occasions when we had people who were either ill um, from the SPR, who on one occasion, we actually had a lady from the SPR that came to um, a demonstration uh, and she was scared. And, and we had to stop the whole thing while she went out. Uh, and uh, this was so, th this actually spoiled the phenomena because, unfortunately, um, I don't think she was skeptical, but she was scared. And that did exactly the same result. Um, but where we had somebody that was sceptical uh, and they sat there sort of really um, um, putting out these these sceptical thoughts, it did affect the phenomena. Well, let's talk a bit about the uh, phenomena. As I recall, the, the very first experience that got your attention was an airport. Yeah, it was indeed. And that was the October of the, um, just after. I mean, we did, we started the experiment actually around about December uh, of 1992. Uh, and we were sitting throughout uh, 1993. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the first thing actually, uh, probably before we had that apport, um, was the fact that um, uh, we we had a trumpet on the table. We didn't know in the beginning that we were working in a new way. And um, so we had it all set up exactly as we would if we were working with ectoplasm. Uh, and I think it was about uh, the May period uh, in 1993. Uh, and in, in that May, we, we actually uh, had uh, one of the trumpets fell off the table. 
uh, the next week uh, it was levitated off the table in a more controlled way uh, and then placed back on the table shortly afterwards. So that, that was the very first phenomenon we had. But in that October, it was building gradually through the year. Um, Sandra wasn't present. She was the only one that wasn't there. And it was the only time that she missed a sitting uh, in all the, the five years that we had. Um, but there, were, there was a, a thump on the table in the middle because by that time we'd been asked to have a, a, a central table that was round in, in, in circumference. Uh, and uh, we heard this, this object fall, and it was quite a bang, onto the table uh, and were told at the time by an independent voice uh, that said to us, this is a sign of greater things to come. Uh, and at the end of the session, of course, we, we were, all we wanted to do was put on the light to see what we'd got. And it turned out to be a coin. Uh, and the coin was a crown, an English crown, uh, that was a, a, known as a Churchill crown because it had a, it had a picture of Winston Churchill on one side. Well, right from the very time that Sandra and I'd started in this, um, in my case, you know, sort of 48 years ago now, um, we had known. Uh, that we'd had some interest um, from Winston Churchill. Uh, we'd spoken to him several times at uh, Leslie Flint's, uh, and also um, the medium we sat with uh, in Romford in the early days. Um, he was a deep trance medium, but he had developed independent voice, uh, and uh, <coughs> he had Winston speak there on, on many occasions. So we were aware from that time that we actually had Winston working with us. And even to this day, uh, he's made his presence known on many occasions. We had this Churchill coin and, and it immediately meant um, to Sandra and myself uh, that things would probably take off from that time. And it did. Um, the transmediumship of both Diana and Alan, um, it had been deep right from the very beginning. Um, but they, they went very, very quickly into trans. I mean, it didn't take more than a few minutes. Uh, and they were both in deep trance. Uh, and uh, the phenomena started to really develop from that point. We had regular levitation. We had uh, regular spirit lights. Uh, we had regular voices. I mean, altogether through the whole of the mediumship at Skoll, we had five different ways uh, of speaking directly with spirit. First one was when our mediums were in, direct, uh, in deep trance. Uh, and they were speak actually the spirit people were speaking through them, uh, often in their own voices. The second way was what's known as extended voice. It was a phenomenon that we'd never heard of before, but was developed at Skull. Uh, and what happened was that the the medium's voice was extended psychically somehow, so it had appeared to come from different points of the room, um, almost instantaneously. So. One moment he, he, it had come from the ceiling, the next moment it had come from under the carpet or even from one of the walls. Uh, and that became known as the, uh, as the extended voice. And the third one, of course, which was the one we were after more than anything, uh, was independent direct voice. So that we were listening to spirit voices in their own, again, in, in, in their own uh, voices as they were on earth, speaking from midair. Uh, and that happened quite a lot there. The fourth one that we got was that through um, a cassette tape recorder um, that we used to play the music on, um, the spirit team were able eventually um, to work a different type of phenomena with that so that they were actually able to speak to us through the amplifier of the, the cassette tape recorder. So we could have a two-way conversation um, through the amplifier of, of, of the cassette tape recorder um, with spirit people. And uh, I always remember uh, when we were giving these seminars to our, our members um, of the Noah's Ark Society and various others at, at Skoll, um, was that there was one guy there who'd lost his uncle about um, six months previously. Uh, and uh, through this tape recorder, his uncle spoke to him for a good five minutes. And he immediately recognized his uncle's voice. And that was it, you know. So they carried on a very evidential conversation. Uh, and the final way uh, that we got to speak with spirit, basically, uh, was after we had had a blueprint um, of a, a, a little device, which we knew as the TDC, 
transdimensional communicating device um, that had been uh, the blueprint was put on an unopened film during one of our sessions um, by um, Thomas Edison actually placed uh, this blueprint on a, an unopened film psychically uh, and asked us to sort of produce this device, which was done. It took a long time, um, several several months, almost almost a year to really get it going properly. Um, but this this little device was plugged again into the amplifier of a cassette tape recorder. Uh, and eventually we were able to get two way conversation between the spirit world and ourselves. Um, but because it was known as the trans dimensional communicator, we were also able to get two way conversation between ourselves uh, and ETs, uh, and that had been the intention right from the very beginning. Uh, the very first person to speak to us um, through that device, and his conversation lasted 15 minutes, um, was Thomas Edison himself. Uh, and he wrote a little note uh, uh, when, when he gave us this blueprint on film, he wrote a little note there to say, if you follow these instructions, it will help you with the communication. Uh, and, and he signed it. Um, TAE, his, his initials. Uh, of course, uh, when this happened, we actually had one of the SPR members was sitting with us. He immediately got in touch with the Edison Institute, uh, who sent him a copy of, of a memo that uh, was from 1926 that Edison had signed with his initials. Uh, and uh, when they compared the initials on, on that memo to the initials on, on the film that we'd got, it was virtually identical, um, but that that device was being um, developed all the time, uh, and we were told that this this TDC device uh, and the way it was being used included a system they called the Idolis system, and that's the interdimensional oral language um, interpretation system. So that basically. If we were getting a communication that came from ETs and not from the spirit world, um, it would it would very, very be one that sounded very robotic to us um, because this idolish system had been put into place. And it meant that however that particular ET or personality thought uh, would go through the system and come out in English, but a robotic English. That's really fascinating. So what, what you're suggesting is that there's some overlap, I'm, I'm going to say in hyperspace, between the spirit world and the other dimensional world of alien beings. That's exactly true. And that's exactly what we came to believe. Um, we had um, our own proof of this because um, there were at least two or three occasions when we actually had a miniature UFO flying around um, the room at Skoll uh, that actually stopped in front of each and every one of the sitters um, to show us exactly. And this, this was a sort of little um, triangular shaped thing that uh, had cabin windows lit up. And it was absolutely quite amazing. Um, so th that occurred. Plus also uh, we had the teleportation uh, in the circle of more than one um, ETs themselves. Uh, and there was one little guy that we called Blue because he left his picture on an unopened um, uh, film uh, for us to see. And he was what you might have described as a grey, um, sort of in, in language to do with ETs. Um, but his colour was blue. Uh, and uh, he actually stood in front of us. He was quite small, um, no more than just over four feet or so. Uh, and uh, he picked up our hands, and it, it was a very, very loving feeling. I mean, the love that came from this character towards us was like a wall. It was fantastic. Uh, and he picked up our hands and put them on his head so that we could feel uh, he wasn't human. Uh, and obviously, his eyes and he, his mouth were totally different from our own. He had very, very short um, and sparse hair on his head. Um, we would have described it as bum fluff, really. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he was a real character, but he has been back and, and he has also materialized in Spain uh, on a couple of occasions and in France on another occasion since then. 
So uh, it seems as if from your description, when you have even the spirit materializations, you get discarnate entities in the same room as the ETs when they materialize. That's quite true, yes. And, uh, and we got the impression, really, uh, that there's not quite what you would call a partnership between the spirit world and ETs, but certainly there's an understanding between them and they work together on many projects. Well, since uh, we've opened the door this far, let me take it a bit further because I, I know, especially toward the end of your book, Witnessing the Impossible, you talk about trans-dimensional communication with humans from the future. It was not voice communication, um, but unfortunately, um, there was another group that was a, a, an experimental circle uh, like our own, but that was sitting in our future. Uh, and this group, for some reason, got onto the right wavelength um, to be able to sort of um, um, get into our sort of crystal energy um, whenever we were sitting. Uh, and that really was how the end of the group came about, um, because we had crystals on our tables. Uh, and of course, our mediums were in deep trance throughout. Um, but we started to notice that there, were, there was a sort of screaming um, sound, very loud, coming from these crystals, and it was preventing the mediums from actually being in trance. So eventually they, they lost the ability to be in trance whilst this was going on. Uh, and we sort of lost communication totally in the end with our spirit group. But it was actually an ET, um, although we came to believe that the guy... Um, was a lord of the cosmos in some way, um, but it was actually an ET uh, called Varan Heerik who got in touch with us right at the end during our last four sittings to explain why, unfortunately, they were going to have to close the thing down. Uh, Spirit didn't want it, we didn't want it, uh, the ETs didn't want it, but this group, they said, was not a group that was evil in any way, shape or form. They were just doing... Um, their, their own form of psychic research, but unfortunately it was messing about um, with our own um, sittings and, and preventing us from being able to be in touch with our own spirit team. So we lost it on that basis and we were told by Varan here it right at the end that he was going to have to close it down. But I'm delighted to sort of report that in fact all of our spirit team at Skull have been back since whilst we've been here in Spain um, because when we first moved over here in 2006, that's um, eight years after Skoll had finished, um, we, in 2007 um, we had uh, so a, a couple of, uh, of um, um, physical mediums from Glasgow came and stayed with us for a week and we had three sittings with them whilst they were in Spain. Their phenomena was very, very similar to the phenomena we'd had at Skull. And during those three sittings, all of our spirit team came back to us and spoke to us. Some of them actually were there in solid uh, personalities. Uh, and we shared a jeep with this couple again in France a couple of months later. Uh, and uh, once again, we had a couple of sittings uh, and we also had our spirit team back again. Very, very evidentially, because information came through there that the two mediums from Glasgow had no idea about, but we knew. If I can understand the situation, you worked very hard for five years to build up the rapport between the two trans mediums and you and Sandra and uh, other people who were members of your group with the spirit team. And I believe the way they phrased it, you had opened up a portal and that portal got discovered by humans from the future who were engaged in some sort of time travel experiments. And it was because of their interference that the spirit team felt that uh, even even though it wasn't an evil interference, it was inadvertent, I suppose. And uh, they felt they had to shut everything down. Yeah, that's, that's it exactly. And one of the things that they explained to us about that at the end um, was that um, if um, we had actually spoken verbally with these people from the future, if they'd been able to achieve that, uh, and they had told us about things that were going to happen in the future, 
uh, and we had reported what we'd heard from the future, uh, that could have upset the whole apple cart. Uh, and uh, things that were intended to happen in the future could have been stopped and changed totally. So, yes, that, that, that was a, a very, very difficult thing. And, of course, Skoll experiment, we have to explain, was an experiment, an, an experiment by us, but also an experiment by the spirit team. And when they built the portal um, to be able to access the, the, um, uh, the Skoll group, um, what happened was that they built it slightly too big. They told us that we would have been able, the intention was that we'd be able to, uh, to actually interact um, with the future, but only by uh, 10 years or so. Uh, and that was what they intended. Um, but unfortunately, um, you know, it had been too wide and they were actually able uh, to access, uh, well, pe people 100 years ahead of us were actually able to access the portal. And that really caused an awful lot of problems. Uh, so they had to close it down. And it was so sad for us at the time, but they've worked on the thing since. And we're quite convinced that the same spirit team is there, ready to start again. Of course, at the end of the first skull, there were just four of us sitting. Uh, so we started off with seven in the group at the very beginning. And gradually, by natural wastage, this whittled down to, uh, to the four people, the two mediums, Sandra and, I, and myself. And we got much better phenomena uh, in the end, really, because we only had four people uh, and the energies between the four of us were so good uh, that we now we're on a point of starting a, a new center um, in Spain, in Andalusia, in uh, Antiquera in July. And we will be sitting uh, with two people who, again, one is a really superb physical medium Uwe Siegert and his wife, Beata Siegert, are just as dedicated um, to the, the spirit work as we are. Uh, and uh, I'm absolutely sure that we will get this similar sort of uh, situation again with the four of us sitting um, as the heart of any group, uh, that it's all going to work extremely well. And we've been told that whatever we get here in Spain will eventually be, be way in advance of anything we achieved at Skoll. In a way, we're sort of going blind into this um, uh, this centre uh, in that we anticipated that we'd be able to sort of afford to buy it um, directly in the beginning. And the way it's come about is totally different. Um, but I do feel uh, that in the way it has come about, uh, the spirit have had a hand in it. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, the one thing we have to do is really we have two years to raise about 300,000 euros. Uh, so that's got to be a priority for us. And so the more people that can become involved, can become members, um, can be, uh, be involved in our different um, uh, events, um, the better. Uh, and, uh, of course, all the way through, we hope to cooperate with, with science. Um, I always say to people that spiritual science uh, is a, a, a normal science, very much like um, chemistry, physics and biology. Um, it's a normal science to be studied and it's, it's the true science of life and the afterlife. And what you achieved at Skull, I know we've just scratched the surface, but uh, it, it's, you know, if, from my perspective as a student of the history of psychical research and parapsychology, it's, it's pretty well unprecedented, the enormity and variety of, of phenomena that you got. For example, we were talking about time travel. It seems as if there could have been some time travel into the past. Uh, you had uh, Helen Duncan materialize, a, a great medium who, uh, who, who passed away decades earlier. And I gather that she airported newspapers into your basement from the 1940s and they appeared as if they were brand new, fresh. Yeah, they, they certainly did. And uh, I mean, Helen Duncan was a great lady in her time. And uh, she had a very, very difficult time during the war. Of course, the reason that she was put in prison and suppressed was the fact that uh, it was very close to D-Day. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, there were sailors 
actually materialising in her seances from ships that had been sunk, um, but it was not wanted for the public to know about anything such as sunken ships. Uh, and consequently, that was why she was suppressed and put in prison at that time. But we, yes, we did. Um, we got newspapers um, from the 1940s, uh, and uh, one of them uh, actually reported the Helen Duncan trial. Now, when these came, and I, I was involved actually for 35 years in paper making. That was my, that was my trade um, at that time. And so I understood a little bit about um, newspapers, certainly from the 1940s, discolouring very, very quickly if they were in the light and the, the um, atmosphere. Uh, within a day, usually, they would go yellow. Uh, and the reason for this is, is that um, the paper was made um, with just crushing the, the, the trees and the impurities were not taken out of the, uh, of the pulp. Uh, and there's one impurity that's called lignin. And this impurity, uh, if the paper hadn't been, if the pulp hadn't been treated chemically, lignin um, was present in, in the newspapers, which was very cheap paper. Uh, and so they would all t uh, turn colour within days. Uh, and when we received these papers, it was almost as though they'd come straight off the press. Um, they were pristine. And yet, although we put them in in um, um, in a box, so they were not in in the light, and and they certainly not they didn't get the atmosphere. Uh, within two or three days, they'd gone yellow. So you know, this this did show that it was genuine wartime paper. And not only that, but uh, the um, SPR guys who sat with us um, got us a sample of this paper and sent it to Pyra which is the Paper Industry Research Association, and they confirmed uh, that it was genuine wartime paper. Um, so certainly this paper had come from the 1940s directly uh, into the 1990s, um, basically over 50 years. So, so it would be fair to say that uh, working with your spirit team, there was a certain amount of experimentation with time travel. Yes, in, indeed, there certainly was. Yeah, um, I mean, I wouldn't say that uh, Helen Duncan um, sort of travelled through time to come and, and and be involved with us, because basically there is no time in the spirit world. That's one of the big things um, that differentiates life on Earth and life in the spirit world. There's no time. Uh, so what happens to us over a period of fifty years? can seem like an instant to people in the spirit world. Um, it just, it, it's difficult to get your mind around the fact that there's no time. Um, but there's, there, there's not really time travel because the now is the now, you know, sort of now and also a, a long time ago. But they're, they're able to move between these date, between these earth dates, if you like. So yes, from that point of view, it's time travel. So I think this is fascinating that what we're really talking about is a mixture of uh, humans from different periods in time, both dead and alive, I suppose, and uh, ETs. Yeah, ex exactly. And the ETs were wanting to more and more to get in touch with, with the Earth um, because they were worried about what we were doing to the Earth, uh, the human race. Uh, and they wanted to stop us from from messing the earth up totally. So they were actually trying to help us uh, to restore the earth to a, a, a better state. Uh, and that's one of the reasons they wanted to be in touch with us. Well, when it comes to phenomena, I suppose the Skull Group is largely remembered these days for the enormity of photographic evidence that uh, occurred in, in your sessions. Yes, indeed. And we had some wonderful um, photographic work. Um, the very early photographic work uh, sort of knocked the stuffing out of us um, because in some early sittings, uh, when we had seven sitters, um, we were told by the spirit team that we could actually bring a camera into the room. Uh, and uh, I would put a, a film, an ordinary film, sort of uh, 36 Mill, uh, 35 millimeter film but with 36 exposures 
uh, into the film uh, and I would take a shot of the outside of uh, through our window at Skoll. And the reason I did that is that I could then identify that that was the film that we'd actually put into the camera uh, at an earlier stage and not something that uh, the spirit world had, had um, substituted, if you like. Um, but the, the first time that this happened, um, we had it one camera and Sandra was actually told to pick it up, uh, point it, uh, and of course there's no light in that room at all, so there, there couldn't have been any proper exposures. Uh, and uh, she was she was asked to point it at the center uh, and whenever somebody said now um, to press the the, um, uh, the release lever on the camera and take another picture so in fact this is exactly what she did uh, and uh, then she put the camera down I think probably there are about four or five pictures they'd said now and then she put it down on a spare chair uh, and then we all heard the camera being levitated um, by spirit and moving around the room again and taking photographs again. Uh, and when that film was developed afterwards, uh, there were 11 uh, separate um, pictures on there, uh, 11 frames, uh, none of which um, was really anything to do with us at all, but they're from all over the world and all sorts of different things on there. Uh, and uh, the, these 11 pictures, but at the beginning of, 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 the, uh, of the film uh, was the picture I'd taken through the window of the garden. So uh, I knew that it was obviously it was the same film that I'd used. And then the very next sitting or, or within a couple of weeks anyway, somebody else brought a picture, uh, brought a camera as well. Uh, and uh, both the cameras were put down. Uh, and both the cameras were levitated and were heard taking pictures all the way around the room. When these these films were developed again, uh, each film had 11 exposures on it uh, that shouldn't have been there because uh, they, they'd never been exposed to any light. Um, but again, there were some quite fascinating photographs that turned up there. And then eventually um, we started to, um, uh, to look at different things we could do with it. Um, for instance... Uh, we started to use ordinary um, Polaroid um, pictures um, that, that are in that were flat flat sheets of photographs that sort of go into the in, into the Polaroid cameras, instant cameras. Uh, but we had to make sure that there was no light on them, so we'd t actually take them out um, during the course of a sitting and put them on the table. But then we had to put them back into the magazine of the um, of the camera um, before the end of the session. Uh, and then we would actually expel them through a blacked out um, camera, um, Polaroid camera. Uh, and uh, when they came out, um, we started to get some very, very interesting um, energy pictures on them. Uh, and when we showed these, we decided that we ought to go to Polaroid and, and have a word with them about this. We showed the, these to Polaroid in the UK uh, and the lady there um, was very, very interested and said she would give us some film. So we ended up actually getting some Polaroid instant films uh, and uh, uh, also 35 mil instant films. And, and she even gave us a, a little developing machine so we could develop these 35 mil ones. Well, this was, this was fantastic for us because, you know, we didn't have too much cash to spare at the time. And each of these uh, Polaroid films uh, the 35 millimeter ones was costing about 25 to 30 pounds. Uh, and she gave us, you know, sort of 60 or 70 of these. So we did a lot of experimentation with them over the period during um, during Skull. But it was quite amazing that, um, you know, Polaroid was so interested uh, that they gave us the films. Uh, and that helped us tremendously. Uh, what I found fascinating, it seemed as if what, what was being done is that the, the film wasn't even put into a camera. You'd have a, a 35 millimeter film strip and uh, the entire strip would be full of different images and designs as if they had literally been written with a pencil or something uh, directly on the film without a uh, relationship to any particular frame. Yeah, absolutely. Certainly, that's exactly how it was done. And of course, what they also asked us to do was to put them um, very often in, into the um, 
plastic container that they were actually shop bought in uh, so that they were ne they, there was never any chance of them being exposed to the atmosphere or to any light of any kind. Uh, and eventually this, this evolved so that we were putting these, um, uh, th these plastic containers with a 35 mil film in it into a wooden box uh, that was secured with a, uh, with a lock uh, and uh, sort of held very often by an SBR personality uh, who was sitting with us. Or we had other people that sat with us on a regular basis. For instance, uh, there was a, a German couple that came and sat with us regularly, uh, and they would actually hold um, this, this box, the, uh, this wooden box. Uh, and on one occasion, we got the most fantastic um, German um, poem uh, that came out on that film. And that was amazing because even to this day, I don't think they've ever discovered who the writer of that poem was. But it was written in very old German, not the more the more modern German of the time. Um, so, you know, it was that was quite amazing. And it was very evidential for the two German sitters that were with us. Now, I know for many people, this kind of uh, what you could call macro psychokinesis is uh, considered absolutely in violation of the normal laws of physics. And therefore, many people assume it has to be fraud. Uh, there couldn't be any other explanation. And I know you've had to contend with that sort of criticism. Oh, absolutely. Crikey. The number of times that people have leveled this at us. Uh, and it's sad in a way, uh, because very often you find a scientist who was a well-known scientist um, who would not actually um, go away from his own learning and his, his own sort of um, his own idea uh, of what should happen or should not happen. And you're exactly right. I mean, these people say to us it has to be fraud because it, it can't be done. Um, but that's one of the reasons we ha we call this this book of mine witnessing the impossible, because that's exactly what we were witnessing on a regular basis. You were one of the four key members of the group. You sat together with these people week after week for five years. One would think if if fraud was going on, you're either in on it or or or, or you would have to have noticed it over that time. Well, exactly. Uh, and for instance, the table that we used in that room, a circular table, uh, was built in such a way that it was solid. Uh, the four cross legs at the bottom were totally solid. So nobody could have actually got under that table or manipulated their way around it. Uh, and of course, what would have been the point? We'd all have been wasting our time uh, and it just was not worth it. So we just accepted it for what it was. It was genuine phenomena. We were delighted that we were getting it. We were delighted that, uh, in a way, um, we were pioneering this new type of work uh, along with the spirit team. Uh, and they explained to us uh, exactly how this energy work um, happened. Um, I, I mentioned uh, how uh, ectoplasm worked before. But the new energy work, um, a creative energy was formed from three different types of energy. Uh, there was no substance coming out of anybody's body in any way, shape or form. Um, what there was, was first and foremost, there was energy from the spirit world that was being brought to our sessions by our spirit team. The second was a spiritual energy that was taken or borrowed um, from the sitters. And the third type of energy uh, was a natural earth energy that occurs in, in uh, naturally in columns or spirals in different geographical places in on this earth. And if a, a, a team are working, as we did with the Skull Group anywhere uh, in, in the world, um, they can actually attract one of these um, one of these uh, natural earth energies um, to them. The spirit team mixed together these three different types of energy uh, and the creative energy that was formed from this was actually kept in a glass dome, which we had on the table at the time. Uh, and from that glass dome, they were able to extract the, the uh, energy uh, and form, form the, the, the different types of phenomena with it. Um, interestingly, um, although the dome played a big part in this, um, when we went abroad to demonstrate, 
Um, of course, we couldn't really take the dome with us because it got shattered in the uh, in the aircraft or what have you. Uh, very delicate things. Uh, and so the domes were left in the skull hole, or that's the cellar we used at, uh, at skull. Uh, and we had a, a, a crystal cluster apported, uh, and that was apported by, by the guide Manu, uh, who produced this beautiful little crystal cluster. And we were told that it had special energies in it. And if we took it with us when we demonstrated, um, the, cre the creative energy would still be kept in the domes at Skull, but could be um, beamed from there into this crystal wherever we were working if it was kept on the table. So we were able to use this this traveling crystal um, wherever we were demonstrating. And we, we did um, demonstrations in the USA, um, in Ireland, um, in France, in, in Germany, in Holland, in Switzerland, uh, and other, other places as well. Uh, and uh, consequently, you know, sort of we, we were getting really good phenomena wherever we sat. Well, that's really quite uh, an extraordinary story, especially the fact that you could get these phenomena in other locations uh, would suggest that if, if some sort of trickery were somehow produced because you'd set things up in your own cellar in the skull hole, well, uh, that couldn't account for phenomenon occurring elsewhere. No, not at all. And there was one instance um, that was very memorable uh, when we sat um, just across the Golden uh, Golden Gate Bridge from San Francisco. Um, the SPR guys set that up. Monty Keane was with us on that visit. Um, and he he had arranged the, um, the session um, in a, a valley, sort of just the other side of the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, but you had to go up a very, very steep um, climb to sort of get to this valley. We had no idea where we were going at all. And we were a bit worried because we had to sort of go there at night time and the the fall off the edge of this road looked a bit dodgy um but we arrived there okay we were not introduced to any of the people that were present most of them um were sort of involved in psychic research in the usa and there were a large number of people there from nasa itself um who sat with us at that session we didn't know any of the personalities and even after the sitting we weren't introduced to them um, we had no idea um, about setting anything up because we were told um, we blacked out the gym and uh, you just get it ready and off we go so there was nothing that could have been brought in um, or, or pre um, pre placed in, in in the room in which we sat and yet the the sitting itself was most fantastic um, it was very evidential uh, we actually had a, a Native American uh, that materialized at the time, um, called a number of the people present by their names, uh, which we didn't know, uh, and also explained that the, the place that this um, uh, this house was uh, had been a very sacred um, sort of Native American site. Uh, and all of this information turned out to be extremely accurate afterwards. Uh, and it was probably one of the best sittings that we did because of the fact we had no idea who we were giving the session to. The only person that we knew there was Monty King. Well, Robin, let me ask you this. Where do you see all of this heading? I know you're about to set up a new institute in uh, Antequera in, in Spain, but over the long run, 100 years from now, perhaps, uh, how, how do you see this evolving? Well, I think 100 years from now, it's going to be quite natural uh, for people from the spirit world uh, to be present uh, and making themselves known to uh, to living beings. Um, I I mean, to begin with, this is going to be in, in sort of sessions where we're, we're doing it under control conditions. But eventually, I think this is going to happen in, uh, in natural light. And uh, they're paving the way. I'm sure the spirit world are paving the way for this to become a normal, natural thing for us to mix with those people who have gone before us. Well, that is a very impressive vision. It would certainly mean a huge change, I think, for humanity, uh, since uh, a large number of people, particularly in our academic institutions and our scientific institutions, seem to be in total denial 
Uh, well, Robin Foy, uh, once again, this has been a marvelous conversation. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart so much for being with me, and I wish you all the best success in your future endeavors. Thank you, Jeff. You're very welcome. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us. Thank you.